have a gavel, but I would bang it. I'll bang my virtual gavel on my desk here. Uh, good morning. The committee will come to order. A quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Since we're all participating remotely today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before I proceed. First, if you're experiencing connectivity issues, please make sure you or your staff contact our designated technical support so they can be resolved immediately. Forum members must make a reasonable effort to participate on camera given the need to maintain a quorum. And if uh, those uh, not speaking could put themselves on mute, we're getting some feedback. Connectivity issues, please make sure you or your staff. Thank you. Uh, members must make a reasonable effort to participate on camera given the need to maintain a quorum. It is committee policy that members will remain muted when not recognized, just like turning your microphone on and off during an in-person hearing. This is out of courtesy to all members on the committee and so that background noise does not interfere with another member who is recognized to speak. When you're recognized, you will need to unmute your microphone. If you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand and communicate through staff that you wish to be recognized, unmute your microphone and ask to be recognized. If you wish to have a document inserted into the record, please ask for unanimous consent and have your staff email the document to veteransaffairs.hearings at mail.house.gov. It will be uploaded to the committee document repository. Please keep in mind that you'll need to refresh the repository page as it does not automatically update. Without objection, members will be recognized in order of committee seniority for questioning witnesses today. This will make it easier for me to ensure all members participating have an opportunity to be recognized. Does any member have a question about the conduct of this hearing with members participating remotely? Hearing none, I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Again, thanks everybody. I, I wanna thank you for joining us online today as we hold our final hearing of the House Veterans Affairs Committee uh, Economic Opportunity Subcommittee for the 116th Congress. The purpose of today's hearing is to review the work that we've done this Congress, and we've done some great work, uh, and to further examine how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting veterans and importantly, to begin the process of building a plan for the 117th Congress so that all of us, Congress, the new administration, and stakeholders such as our VSOs who are represented here today can hit the ground running together on day one. I recognize that this committee will look different in the new year. Uh, I hope very strongly to uh, continue as the chairman of this subcommittee. Uh, but regardless of the makeup of the subcommittee, I hope that I can speak for all of us in saying that these issues that we've worked on uh, will remain priorities for our respective offices. And we owe it to the members who will join the subcommittee in the next Congress to give them a head start in understanding how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted veterans' livelihoods and what relief is needed. Just on Friday, we saw new numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They, they certainly were uh, an eye-opener to me. Uh, that veterans unemployment actually rose to 6.3 percent in november so at the beginning of the pandemic as we know it went up to over 11 percent it was dropping went down to, i believe 5.9 and then we saw that it went back up and uh, that's even as the overall unemployment rate continued to decline that translates that 6.3 percent uh, translates into about 550 thousand veterans who were looking for employment last month out of roughly 8.7 million working age veterans who are able to work. Clearly, COVID-19 is not behind us, it is in front of us. And it's imperative that this Congress act swiftly on measures such as H.R. 7105, legislation that I offered with my friend, a ranking member of the full House Veterans Affairs Committee, Dr. Phil Rowe, to create new rapid retraining employment programs to support veterans who are out of work due to COVID-19. The 116th Congress is not over yet, and I remain hopeful that some or even many of the issues that we hear about today can still be passed into law this month. And for those watching at home, there is still a lot of work that the House and Senate must do before the new year. And that includes a long list of veterans policies passed by the House but outstanding in the Senate. And here's just a small list. 
improvements to the quality of education that veterans receive, reforms to reach our goal of eliminating veteran homelessness, temporary COVID-related measures to help VA and veterans weather this storm, employment protections for our service members, expansion of the VA home loan program to serve more veterans, improved benefits for the families of fallen service members, and a host of other measures. In addition, next year will present new challenges to veterans, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses to hear what new issues this committee needs to focus on after the first of the year. Finally, as we enter an especially difficult winter, we should all remember those less fortunate than ourselves. COVID-19 has placed many families on the brink of homelessness and food insecurity. It's estimated that the pandemic has left 15 million more households wondering where their next meal will come from. It's tragic and unacceptable that in a nation like ours, so many would be forced to go without basic necessities. If you are or if you know a veteran facing homelessness, please call VA's National Center for Homeless Veterans at 877 4 aid vet for assistance. That's 877-424-3838. And if you or someone you know needs help putting food on the table, I urge you to contact USDA's SNAP information line at 1-800-221-5689. I know these are trying times, but I want to assure everyone watching that this committee will continue working to deliver COVID-19 support to our veterans and to our families nationwide. And with that, I now would like to recognize my friend, the ranking member from Florida, Gus Bilirakis, for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, very well said, by the way, uh, with regard to helping our, our heroes during this epidemic. Uh, thank you for holding this important hearing, of course, as we look ahead to the 117th Congress. There's no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has upended the lives of American veterans. All of the restrictions that were placed on our booming economy to combat COVID. estimated half a million veterans who were unemployed last month. Uh, they're amongst veterans, uh, and we need to do everything we possibly can. And by passing your bill, do not paint the full picture of the impact of uh, COVID-19 that has had on veteran employment as they do not include the thousands of veterans, especially women veterans, who have been forced to leave the workforce. These numbers also do not include the veterans who have seen their income or hours cut. Okay, for new ones, like the rapid retraining program, uh, Chairman Levin, and I proposed earlier this year, and the main co-sponsor uh, is, of course, Chairman Levin, and uh, and then, of course, uh, our ranking member, full ranking member, Dr. Rowe. Congress will need to fundamentally shift the way we oversee how government employment services are provided to veterans. The Department of Labor and state workforce agencies will need to focus less on face-to-face -face meetings, leading to minimum uh, wage jobs, but instead embrace technology to help prepare veterans for jobs in the new post-COVID-19 economy. To that end, we should be focusing on expanding programs such as the Vet Tech pilot program or fellowship programs like the one created by the U.S. Chamber of Congress, Hire Our Heroes. Uh, next Congress, this subcommittee should also continue to examine the impact COVID-19 will have on student veterans. This spring, I was proud to work with the majority 
our colleagues in the U.S. Senate, the VA uh, and VSOs to quickly authorize VA to extend four monthly housing allowance payments to GI Bill users who were forced to move to full-time online classes as a result of COVID-19. However, this quick work would not have been necessary if my bill HR 3897 had been enacted. This bill would end the practice of shortchanging full-time online students by limiting their GI living allowances to half of the national average. I look forward to working with members to end this disparity and enact this bill early in the 117th Congress. I'd love to get it done now uh, before the end of the year. Uh, we filed this bill, oh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, and, and the idea, of course, came from our Veterans Advisory Council, our Student Veterans Advisory Council, by the way. Uh, so it is a priority of mine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are the two biggest priorities for next year as I see them. But I plan on spending the rest of this hearing in, in, full, in full listening mode. I look forward to hearing from the diverse group, groups of veteran organizations we have with us today as they lay out what they believe should be the subcommittee's priorities in the next Congress. Our VSO's partners' input uh, is in, instrumental in our shared successes, and I look forward to our discussion today. I, I want to wish uh, Ashlyn uh, for congratulations from TAFS on your engagement. Uh, and uh, again, before I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to take a moment and thank the chairman uh, for his friendship uh, and bipartisanship uh, this Congress. Throughout our time together, you and your staff have been nothing but fair to me and my colleagues on this side of the aisle, and that's the way it should be. From helping push to enact the much needed reforms in, Ryan, in the Ryan Cools specialty adaptive housing law, to our current efforts to get other economic priorities enacted uh, in the end of the year package and our work on tackling veteran homelessness. I thank you for your commitment to working with us uh, to help America's veterans. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure uh, and I look forward to continuing our productive bipartisan friendship and working together with you in the future. I know we can be, do real good work together as we have done in the past. I also uh, want to thank my staff here on the committee, uh, John Clark, who has done an outstanding job, and Grayson Westmoreland uh, for the outstanding job that they've done the past two years. They really have. Uh, much of the bipartisan success that we've been able to accomplish this Congress has been due to the no small part of the hard work John and Grayson, and I might add, uh, my staff or my personal staffer, uh, Chris, has done an outstanding job, Chris Jones. Uh, and he's from your part of the country, Mr. Chairman. He does a great job for our veterans. Uh, and, and they've negotiated, they're negotiating and advocating again for our na nation's veterans. I'm grateful to have been able to work with them, this Congress, and look forward to more success. And together, uh, we'll work together in the upcoming Congress as well. Let's hope so, uh, God willing. And uh, I also want to recommend, uh, I know it's very tough during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, but there are ways to do it uh, with social distancing. But uh, I've had veterans jobs fair over the years, uh, specifically for veterans, and they've been extremely successful. So I'm considering uh, doing one uh, next year but again, we'll follow the proper protocols. Last one that I did, strictly for veterans, uh, we had over 700 veterans. Uh, and, and I know that they were successful in attaining good uh, paying jobs, high-tech jobs in most cases. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yell back. Well, I thank the ranking member very much for uh, his uh, continued spirit of collaboration and collegiality and uh, look forward to uh, working with you uh, in the new Congress. And just so you know, Mr. Ranking Member, the first minute or so, you were a, a little bit, the, the connection was a little choppy, and then it was fine for the rest. So if there's anything that you want to repeat from the first minute or so, 
uh, you know, during Q&A, take any extra time you need, again, in the spirit of collegiality and cooperation. So we want to make sure everybody's heard from, uh, but truly grateful to continue our good work together. Uh, and as Chairman Takano, there he is. Okay, so uh, it's a great honor and privilege to get to recognize uh, for an opening statement someone uh, who has done, uh, I think, just an extraordinary job of uh, chairing the House Veterans Affairs Committee in the 116th Congress, and I know he'll do uh, an equally outstanding job in the 117th Congress. I've gotten to learn so much uh, watching you, Mr. Chairman, and grateful you've joined our, our subcommittee, and I, I'd love to recognize you for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Levin, and uh, I want to also thank uh, Ranking Member Bilirakis uh, for holding this important hearing on the priorities of veteran service organizations as we continue to fight COVID-19 and how we can help veterans recover from the health and economic crisis. And I thank you for your kind words, Chairman Levin, uh, your enthusiasm uh, for uh, the responsibilities you've undertaken has been inspiring. Um, it was inspiring to hear uh, Ranking Member Bilirakis uh, praise uh, the bipartisan spirit in which you have uh, chaired uh, this very important subcommittee. Um, and um, I congratulate you both. Uh, uh, you have both, uh, you know, uh, had amazing uh, and important legislative accomplishments this year, uh, both uh, Ranking Member Belarakis and yourself, uh, legislative accomplishments that really will uh, forward the action uh, in serving our veterans. Um, it is often stated uh, what I'm about to say, but we are un in unprecedented times. Uh, we do know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. M multiple vaccines are being developed and manufactured uh, as we speak. Um, so there is hope, you know, to recover from this pandemic by the end of next year. Um, but the economic ramifications will be long lasting. Um, I'm seeing reports of veteran unemployment, veterans unemployment among veterans um, exceeding that of the, of the general population. Uh, those uh, whose work, uh, those whose program of education or job training was interrupted, uh, those who have been out of work and those who could not pay their rent and mortgage will not be made whole once the vaccine is widely available. So we don't have the luxury to wait until next year uh, until the next Congress to start devising a strategy to help our country's heroes, which is why we are here today. So very, thank you very much for both of you uh, uh, holding this important hearing uh, of the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. And I yield back. Well, I, again, I thank the chairman for all his great work on behalf of our veterans and, and uh, looking forward to working together for a long time to come. I also wanted to uh, just briefly uh, mirror uh, the comments of the ranking member with regard to our terrific staff, our committee staff. They, they work very well together, but I want to thank uh, Justin, Chris, and Julian, and then, of course, Faith Williams on my personal staff. All, all do a wonderful job, and we're really uh, in debt to them. None of this work uh, can happen without all the, the good uh, behind-the-scenes committee uh, staff work that's happening and the, also the collegiality between our uh, respective staffs, uh, Gus, I think, uh, really speaks well to uh, the, there being hope for us all in Congress. Uh, so we, we look forward to keeping up that good work. And uh, I would like to uh, now turn to our witnesses uh, who have been waiting patiently. So I thank them all for that. Uh, joining us on today's panel, we have Mr. Pat Murray, Director, National Legislative Service of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mr. John Kamen, Assistant Director, Veterans Employment and Education Division of the American Legion, and he has the best Zoom background, I think, as well. That's pretty cool. Uh, Ms. Maureen uh, Elias, Associate Legislative Director of the Paralyzed Veterans for, uh, of America. Great to see you. Uh, Ms. Ashlyn Haycock, Deputy Director of Policy, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Mr. Victor Lagrun, Director of the Black Veteran Empowerment Council and Ms. Lauren Augustine, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Student Veterans of America, great to see you. Uh, and Ms. Tanya Eng, Vice President of Veterans Education 
success. Thank you for joining us. And as you know, uh, you'll have five minutes to uh, give your oral statement, but your full written statement will be added to the record. With that, I now recognize Mr. Murray for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bill Rockus, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and its Auxiliary, thank you for the opportunity to provide a remarks on VFW priorities before this subcommittee. First, the VFW would like to thank this committee for their engagement and productivity during the 116th Congress. These past two years, the House of Representatives have passed 74 veteran bills, 28 of which have become law, many originating in this subcommittee. We appreciate the cooperation and bipartisanship of all the members of this subcommittee and would especially like to thank your respective staffs for all the hard work they put in to make this committee as productive as it is. There are a few proposals that were introduced by this subcommittee that frankly have stalled in the Senate and unfortunately do not look like they're going to pass this Congress. The VFW would like to see proposals such as auto grant improvements, the rapid retraining program, fourth administration, vet tech expansion, and others to be reintroduced at the start of next Congress, so hopefully they can be passed into law in the next session. But I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about some larger new issues that VFW would like to focus on in the 117th Congress. The VFW urges the administration to request in Congress to authorize and appropriate approximately $250 million for the digital GI Bill upgrade. We feel this is the best cost efficient upgrade to bring VA education services into the 21st century. A one-time infusion of resources for VA's IT programs specifically aimed at ed services would overhaul many of the long-needed platforms that office is struggling to maintain and allow VA education services to properly function instead of consistently requiring workarounds and patchwork solutions to maintain functionality. The current legacy systems ed services has to maintain cost approximately $33 million every year, some of them being decades old. This proposal is estimated to cost approximately $250 million and be implemented in 12 to 18 months. Hopefully, if the digital GI Bill is implemented, the taxpayers would begin to see savings after year eight of this investment. The digital GI Bill would also be able to accommodate many of the requests Congress and veteran service organizations have been making for years, such as GI Bill comparison tool upgrades, a replacement for VA once, digital certificate of eligibility, and easier management of data sharing platforms. The VFW is also interested in improving private sector and civilian credentialing for military civilian for certain military occupational specialties. There are many service members who leave active duty to pursue employment in the same vocations for which they were trained during military service. Unfortunately, this is not usually possible because military training does not align with state issued professional licenses or trade association credentials. We fully realize this issue does not have an easy one step legislative fix. However, we ask that in the 117th Congress, this subcommittee uses this authority to help convene the different parties, DOL, DOD, state and local entities, and veteran stakeholders to help identify roadblocks and workshop solutions that can work from a legislative perspective. The VFW would like this committee to host roundtables or listening sessions with the ultimate goal of a potential legislative hearing to help combat this problem. The VFW would also like to see more attention paid to AmeriCorps Equal Justice Works Program, funded by the Corporation for National and Community Service. The VFW urges Congress to increase funding for AmeriCorps legal services programs that specifically benefit homeless veterans. Additionally, an initiative should be created to form a partnership between VA and AmeriCorps to improve outreach to homeless veterans and to permit legal workshops to convene at VA facilities. The VFW recommends consolidating the available resources offered by AmeriCorps and various veteran legal clinics under one umbrella and using VA facilities to conduct these workshops. We feel this would greatly help the outreach and effectiveness of these legal services for veterans. Finally, the VFW believes the current scale for GI Bill housing allowance does not offer full parity for students attending on school online. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic pushed most education classes to an online only format for extended periods of time. This highlighted the need to revamp the housing payment scale for online training. 
The DFW recommends a standardized payment model for all online education training that sets a standard rate closer to the in-person payment rates for all GI Bill beneficiaries utilizing online or distance learning. Online platforms for learning have evolved much closer to the in-person classroom experience in recent years. While the VFW still believes in-person classes offers many tangible and intangible benefits, the development of online platforms have significantly closed the gap between in-person and online classes in the past few years. Chairman Levin, this concludes my testimony. I'm prepared to answer any questions you or the subcommittee members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Appreciate it very much. I now recognize uh, Mr. Kamen for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Villarocas, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a pleasure to join you from the Legion's Washington, D.C. bunker. On behalf of National Commander Bill Oxford and our nearly two million members of the American Legion, we thank you for the opportunity to testify about our economic priorities in these unprecedented times. As the largest veteran service organization in America, we strive to ensure that all veterans have the opportunity to provide with honor and dignity the economic necessity of life for themselves and their families. I take a second to also applaud uh, the ranking member for his work on job fairs. Uh, we've been navigating the digital job fairs ourselves. Uh, we've held fairs in Texas and North Carolina, and we'd be happy to coordinate uh, with the staff. Uh, it is certainly a new area of these digital fairs. Uh, now, the circumstances of this hearing are extraordinary. With the unemployment rate, as the chairman mentioned, uh, really doubling since January of 2020, with over 550,000 veterans now out of work. We highlight this with no apprehension that this struggle is shared with that of our friends, family, and neighbors as we adjust to this new, ever-shifting normal. In front of us is a harsh winter with fears compounded by congressional uncertainty. But the House Veterans Affairs Committee has demonstrated that substantial collaboration is possible, and this subcommittee remains, the, I believe, the crown jewel of that bipartisan spirit. We need luminaries, and we're dedicated to helping you pass legislation that empowers veterans' education, small business, and employment pathways. Not just because it needs to be done, but because America learned from it. Before there was Social Security, we had disability compensation and pension. Before there was a Fannie Mae or Ginnie Mac, we had the VA Home Loan Program. And before there was a Higher Education Act, there is the GI Bill. America has always been dedicated to investing in the citizens that have put their lives on the line for her defense. And more often than not, when we do that, we learn how we can enfranchise the rest of the country as well. With this perspective, I will discuss three separate topics, education, apprenticeships, and small business. Concerning education, the American Legion is indeed concerned that the COVID-19 epidemic has exacerbated economic conditions that will lead to more predatory recruitment targeting of veterans and bad actor institutions. An October report by the National Student Clearinghouse has shown that undergraduate enrollment at for-profit institutions has risen 3% since last year, in contrast to a precipitous 9.4% drop in community college enrollment. Now, these numbers are not altogether unexpected. As many for-profit schools uh, are positioned to meet the needs of non-traditional students eager to adapt to new workforce conditions. But good after or bad, the GI Bill's inclusion on the 10% side follows as an albatross incentivizing aggressive targeting of veterans to balance against the Title IV student aid. Until this loophole is closed, veterans will continue to be pursued as a counterweight uh, that makes sound economic sense for institutions. Now, the positive news is that the Senate has reached consensus as to the existential threat that this faces to veterans education with bipartisan sponsorship of S2857. The American Legion calls on members of this subcommittee to help shepherd this common sense and long overdue legislative fix into law. While we stand in agreement with the need to build higher education pathways for our veterans, more must still be done to bridge the world of education with the world of work. In 1937, Congress passed the historic National Apprenticeship Act which empowered the Department of Labor to codify rules and regulations, empowering registered apprenticeships as means to gainful employment. Now, the National Apprenticeship Act of 2020 will reauthorize this bill for the first time in its 87 year history, codifying many of the regulations in the statute and modernizing them to meet the needs of today's workforce through targeted grants and partnerships. Such modernization would not be complete without recognizing the unique potential veterans have to take advantage and succeed in apprenticeship opportunities. The American Legion applauds Congressman Connor Lamb and Brian Fitzpatrick's successful efforts to secure critical veteran provisions in this bill, and we encourage its immediate passes in the Senate. Finally, I would like to share a new resolution ratified by our executive committee over our fall meetings. With resolution number 13, support by American policies within the federal government, the American Legion now officially supports legislation and policies that incentivize the return to manufacturing from overseas and the creation of more domestic manufacturers, including veteran-owned small businesses. 
is not to ignore that we live in a globalized economy. Advocating for wholesale and sourcing of all the products and decoupling our economy from the world is not an option. However, we must be honest and concede that as a nation, we have become more reliant on foreign source products for our safety and protection from the spread of COVID-19. As a nation, we must chart a new course to eliminate dependencies from foreign sources for some products that have national security and strategic importance. The Buy American Act only requires that goods purchased by the federal government are 50% manufactured in America. A substantial amount of raw materials and components in made in the USA labeled goods are still sourced from overseas. This has to change. The government must programmatically incentivize the domestic manufacturing emergency supplies to protect, protect manufacturing jobs and prevent supply chain breakdowns in future pandemics. The American Legion appreciates the opportunity to share our priorities with the subcommittee. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you, Mr. Kamen, and uh, happy holidays to you as well. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Elias for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Billy Rackus, Chairman Takano, and members of the subcommittee. Paralyzed Veterans of America, or PVA, would like to thank you for the opportunity to discuss our priorities for the 117th Congress concerning how our nation can best support our veterans, particularly those with disabilities, through the pandemic and beyond. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of PVA to thank the committee and especially Chairman Levin and Ranking Member Billy Rackus for your diligent efforts to ensure the Ryan Cools and Paul Benny Specially Adapted Housing Improvement Act of 2019 made it across the finish line. This benefit will help so many veterans remain safely in their homes. We believe that Congress and the administration will have a tremendous opportunity in the coming year to improve benefits for the most severely disabled veterans and empower them to fully participate in the recovery of our nation's economy. My oral statement today will highlight three key areas of focus. Transportation resources available through the VA, employment services and supports to help unemployed and transitioning veterans, and finally, VA IT infrastructure needs. First, this pandemic has shown a spotlight on the need for catastrophically disabled veterans to have access to an adapted vehicle to get them to and from health care appointments, work, school, and to meet family obligations. Public transportation schedules have been dramatically reduced in some areas due in part to local restrictions implemented to address the spread of the virus. Fear of exposure to COVID-19 and the prospect of an adverse outcome should they contract the virus also decreases the willingness of high-risk veterans to rely upon others to assist them with their transportation needs. Thus, one of our top 21, 2021 legislative priorities will be improving transportation assistance for the most severely disabled veterans. PBA urges this committee to pass legislation like H.R. 5671, the Advancing Uniform Transportation Opportunities for Veterans Act, or Auto for Veterans Act, which greatly improves access to VA's automobile grant. Additionally, we ask that you institute a grant program or other benefit for veterans with non-service connected catastrophic disabilities like spinal cord injuries or disorders towards the purchase of an adaptive equipment to empower these veterans to, with the ability to transport themselves to medical appointments, employment, and activities of daily living, such as grocery shopping. Also, as VA finalizes its handbook governing Automobile Adaptive Equipment, or AAE, we encourage the subcommittee to conduct an oversight hearing on this program to ensure the changes are effectively addressing the needs of eligible veterans. Require VA to establish a task force of VA and veteran service organization experts to write and review recommendations for reimbursement of AAE, and direct VA to set in place a mechanism to review the effectiveness of the AAE program. Second, even before the pandemic, employment rates for veterans with significant disabilities including many PVA members, consistently lagged behind those of their counterparts without disabilities. We are concerned that those who were previously facing challenges in the employment landscape are seeing these challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the current economic recession. Getting, getting veterans back to work requires more than a one-size-fits-all solution. We need a shift in focus and more targeted allocation of resources focused on populations who need the most support to get them into jobs that are in demand. Public-private partnerships, non-traditional solutions, and legislation aimed at rapidly retraining veterans into high-demand jobs will play a large part in any successful effort to get veterans back into the labor market. Many federal employment programs primarily focus on younger veterans transitioning from military service, whose disabilities have little to no impact on their ability to gain and maintain employment, which means veterans with significant disabilities 
older veterans and those in remote areas who continue to face significant employment challenges, including high unemployment and underemployment, are left behind. Federal programs must expand their focus to ensure they are meeting the needs of these populations. It is not only financially important to get veterans back to work, but it is also better for their overall health. We would also like to see the transition assistance program adapted to help veterans leaving the military service with acquired disabilities understand their ADA rights, as well as other federal programs like Social Security that are available to support them. Finally, the Veterans Benefits Administration's lagging IT infrastructure requires business lines to create and perform workarounds. While tapping into COVID-related funds may be less than ideal, the prospect of this aging system failing as veterans' reliance on VA increases necessitates action. If the IT funding issue is not resolved by this Congress, it must be a top priority in 2021. PVA would once again like to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to submit our views on how our nation can support our veterans through and after COVID-19. We look forward to working on addressing each of these issues in the coming year. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Elias. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Haycock for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bilirakis, and distinguished committee members. The Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors thanks you for the opportunity to speak today on issues of importance to the families we serve, the families of the fallen. TEPS has many legislative priorities for the 117th Congress and several outstanding priorities before this committee that we believe will pass before the end of the year. Today, we will address three issues we would like to see legislation for next year. Allowing surviving spouses who remarry to retain education benefits, guaranteeing in-state tuition for Chapter 35 recipients, and expanding eligibility for the Fry Scholarship to those who die in the line of duty during the 120-day release from active duty period. A long-term goal for TAPS is to secure the right for surviving spouses to remarry at any age and retain their benefits. Allowing surviving spouses to retain education benefits is a great starting point and will help create precedent. A surviving spouse's ability to afford an education should not be impacted by the fact that they choose to remarry after the death of their military loved one. Military spouses are one of the most unemployed and underemployed populations in our country. Due to frequent moves, careers become difficult to maintain, and it's almost impossible for them to fully vest in their own retirement. After the death of a military loved one, many surviving spouses choose to follow their own dreams by pursuing or rekindling a career or charting a new path because of their loss. Surviving spouses rely on their education benefits to pay for college and should not be forced to forfeit them if they remarry. We hear from many surviving spouses who would be impacted such as Leslie McCadden Mendoza. Leslie is the surviving spouse of Captain Michael McCadden, who died by suicide in 2012. She met her current husband, Rob, two years later. Leslie and Rob are devout Catholics, who had to choose between what was right in the eyes of their family and church and financial security for them. Leslie has three children, and Rob has four children from his late wife. They decided to cohabitate for several years to best provide for their family. When the COVID-19 pandemic began last spring, Leslie and Rob were concerned about what would happen to their children if one of them were to die of COVID. They are both incredibly high risk due to Rob's multiple sclerosis. They legally married in April 2020. Leslie no longer has access to her Fry scholarship and can no longer afford to continue attending Chapman University. She has since withdrawn. Because Rob's disability is permanent, they live on a fixed income. Leslie does not believe she will ever be able to afford to return to college. Restoring education benefits for surviving spouses would improve Leslie's ability to financially support her children. TAPS is grateful to the committee for pursuing legislation in the past to guarantee in-state tuition for Fry Scholarship recipients and post-9-11 GI Bill recipients. Unfortunately, surviving families using Chapter 35 benefits are excluded. Chapter 35 is the most outdated education benefit VA provides. Even with a $200 increase under the Forever GI Bill, it's slightly more than half of what the Montgomery GI Bill covers, and a small amount in comparison to the post-9-11 GI Bill. Chapter 35 only covers around $11,000 per year, which does not even cover the cost of in-state tuition in most places. Ensuring in-state in tuition for Chapter 35 recipients will reduce the amount of student loans needed to cover the cost of college. This critical change will make a tremendous impact on the lives of over 100,000 Chapter 35 recipients without costing the federal government more money. Finally, we'd like to address expanding eligibility for the Fry Scholarship. While sunsetting Chapter 35 and moving everyone to the Fry Scholarship is a long-term goal for TAPS, we understand that it would be very expensive. 
Instead, we are asking that those who die in the line of duty during the 120 day release from active duty refrad period be included in the Fred scholarship. Those who die during the refrad period are eligible for every other benefit afforded to active duty survivors, such as the SGLI, death gratuity, TRICARE for Life, DIC, and SBP, but they are excluded from FRAD. Some surviving spouses, such as Astrid Rushford, lost their loved ones within hours of separation from the service. Astrid's husband, Technical Sergeant Richard Rushford, attempted suicide in December 2001. While Richard was on life support, the military decided to medically retire him, effective immediately. Richard succumbed to his injuries a few hours later, but because of the military's decision, Astrid and her two children are not eligible for the prize scholarship. She is one of hundreds of surviving families who view themselves as active duty losses, but are denied benefits due to a technicality. TAPS appreciates the opportunity to address the committee on these important issues affecting surviving families. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haycock. Uh, Mr. Lagrun, I'd uh, like to thank you for joining us. I think this is the first time you've testified uh, before us, but I certainly hope it's not the last. And uh, welcome, and you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Levin, as well as Chairman Takano. You know, I want to begin by saying, uh, on behalf of the Black Veterans uh, Empowerment Council, we would not be here today if not for the efforts of Chairman Takano, who hosted a roundtable, who really made it a poignant point that we come together, think logically about how we can address the growing needs of these uh, various committees, but also the various communities that we serve. Uh, in particular, the Black Veterans Empowerment Council really would like to focus on several key issues today. And I wanna start with benefit usage. Um, as we know that there's a, a serious disparity between what veterans are receiving, what benefits, what veterans are also educated around what benefits. And we often find that these veterans who are from underserved communities, recruited from these communities, often return back to those communities. So as we look at both Black, Latino, and also Native American veterans who are recruited from populations and communities that they, re that they leave seeking to gain and gather uh, other benefits and resources often return back to those communities in need of those same benefits. So we urge today that one, this subcommittee helps us by encouraging the VA to expand its outreach and make sure that this outreach is more targeted to the populations that are in need of these resources, but also make sure that we are using outreach techniques that are culturally competent. One of the other issues I'd like to address today is the veterans returning home today are in further need of resources, in particular because of the effects of COVID-19. And as we've seen, COVID-19 has not just ravaged certain communities, it has impacted almost all communities. But who has it impacted the most? Those populations that are either unemployed, underemployed, or cannot shelter in place, right? The people who are every day going out, trying to support their families, making sure that they are a part of today's fiber to both support their families and communities are having the hardest time, but are also hardest hit by our COVID numbers. As we see this growing disparity, the BLS numbers are also spelled out for us that many of these veterans are impacted by COVID-19 setting down of companies and organizations. But what we're not tracking is the underemployment number. The underemployment number is vastly greater than what we probably anticipate because the Department of Labor does not have a firm grip on what that number looks like. So it's not fully being reported to your organization. I'm sorry, your committee. So again, we really do need the weight of this subcommittee to ensure that we're bringing in organizations like the VA, the VBA, HUD, as well as Department of Labor vets to ensure that we're wrapping our arms around the veteran population in the most trying time. We are not going to be out of this just because we have a new vaccine. We're still gonna be in the long run for at least the next calendar year. And this economic recovery will take several years. What we want to ensure is that there's equitable access to these benefits and also equitable utilization of these benefits. So whether they be stabilizing housing for veterans through HUD, ensuring that veterans are able to pursue the American dream through home ownership, which does allow them to foster better economic stability within their community and within their homes, but also 
we really need to think about how we encourage other organizations and companies to make veterans first when it comes to their employment strategies. If we're able to do that as well and incentivize many of these companies to do so, we'll see that more and more veterans will be targeted for employment and the veteran unemployment levels will continue to decrease. As they are currently, they're increasing. And yes, they're increasing their cost the board, but they're disproportionately increasing, not just for veterans, but also minority veterans. So this is something we really should keep our eye on as we um, look to pursue some better outcomes. Um, just a little bit to focus on another key issue, which is UCMJ usage. There's a growing disparity, as we've seen, that has uh, all the elements of bias when we see veterans who are impacted by UCMJ. And what we would like to see is better oversight of how we are utilizing that disciplinary action and also tracking which communities are most impacted because those veterans who return back to communities, that falls back on the local municipality to support them because they don't have the benefits that they would have normally had through discharge. And finally, just to kind of make sure that we're encapsulating where we are with COVID-19, we really do need a refined focus because any level of support from the federal government isn't going to be enough. We literally need to make sure that we're showing up those nonprofits and NGOs that are there to support and serve those veterans before um, people fall into a more destitute situation. Thank you for your time and I yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Lagoon. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Augustine for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bill Arrakis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing Student Veterans of America to testify on our priorities for the next Congress and how COVID-19 is impacting our community. With more than 1,500 on-campus chapters, Student Veterans of America is committed to the empowerment of yesterday's warriors. Through a supportive network of chapter leaders, SVA works to transform the skills and experience of student veterans to ensure they achieve their greatest potential. Thanks to the hard work of you, your staff, and your counterparts in the Senate, we are at the one yard line with a list of long-standing priorities, such as expanding in-state tuition, strengthening student protections, and increasing access to transition assistance, with the hope that so many of these priorities will be sent to the president's desk in the next couple of weeks, we are excited about the possibilities for what is next. As a caveat, the majority of our policy priorities stem from direct interactions with student veterans at our programs, including our national conference. NatCon 2021 will be held virtually February 19th and 20th and is shaping up to have record-breaking attendance. We look forward to finalizing our full list of legislative priorities soon after it concludes and sharing them with the subcommittee. However, based on what we've already heard, we are committed to centering on a new mindset. The GI Bill is the front door of the VA. According to VA's journey map, using the GI Bill is oftentimes one of the first interactions a newly transitioned veteran will have with VA. Getting that interaction right, making a good first impression, is critical to a lifelong positive relationship with VA and a successful transition overall. We can create the most generous benefits, easiest access to care, and build in the greatest assurances of quality. But if we overlook how those benefits are perceived and received by veterans, are we doing them justice? This is a big idea. And we admittedly do not have every answer for what this front door needs to look like, but today we are calling for the start of that conversation. We do know it has to include things like providing VA dedicated and sufficient funding to modernize its education IT systems, addressing the friction points between GI Bill and higher education administration, and looking at the daily lives of student veterans and how we support their journey as a whole. We look forward to working together with you and our chapter leaders to explore the specifics of how we make the GI Bill the best front door possible. Additionally, as is the case for many Americans, we know COVID-19 is having significant impacts on the education and well-being of student veterans, which will need to continue being addressed next year. We've surveyed veterans across the country for the past several months on a variety of topics, including their thoughts on the pandemic. While we will gladly share the entirety of the data with any interested office, we did want to highlight a few key points today. Roughly half of respondents shared their monthly income is either not enough to pay bills or leaves little left over after paying bills. Nearly six in 10 student veteran parents report an issue with loss of childcare or school closures 
negatively impacting their ability to work. More than 80% have some concern about COVID-19 impacting their academic goals or delaying progress towards a degree or certificate. And more than 80% have a pessimistic view of the economy. We recognize much of what can be done, done to address these COVID-19 concerns reside outside the work of this subcommittee. But student veterans are depending on you to be their voice and advocate in all ongoing COVID-19 conversations. Specific to the subcommittee, some of our first recommendations are to review and study the emergency needs specific to the GI Bill uncovered this past year and take a two-prong approach to preventing future mass confusion and concern. First, as an immediate assurance, Congress should consider codifying the flexibilities created earlier this year, which can be activated immediately when a national emergency is declared. Having something ready to deploy will prevent the need for Herculean legislative efforts in the future and allow for more effective GI Bill governing in emergencies. Second, and a much larger and long-term effort, we know the patchwork of flexibilities is just that, a patchwork and inherently not perfect. A more sustainable emergency solution should also be studied. And any in-depth review of COVID-19's impact should also ensure additional government programs like unemployment are not inadvertently overlooking student veterans and their own emergency responses. Beyond COVID-19 specific conversations and our big picture idea of GI Bill being VA's front door, rest assured, SVA will continue to support and identify policies that improve the daily lives and well-being of student veterans and their families, increase the efficacy of government programs such as closing the 9010 loophole, and elevate the success and value of an educated veteran population. We look forward to working with this subcommittee and the whole of Congress to better serve and support our student veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hartstein. I now recognize Ms. Ang for five minutes. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bilirakis, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Given the current national crisis and recession, it is more important than ever that veterans are provided access to high quality programs that will help them secure successful civilian employment. We would like to provide the following recommendations to help ensure a strong return on investment for the hard earned GI Bill benefits of veterans during the COVID crisis and beyond. First, we encourage the subcommittee to ensure student veterans have the same protections as other students in quality in online learning. During COVID, many colleges have moved their classes online. Unfortunately, we have heard from students that instead of having direct interaction with their professors, they have spent their time watching YouTube videos. YouTube is not a suitable substitute for face-to-face -face contact with professors, especially when there are platforms that allow for large attendance and lecture-like presentations directly from the professors. The subcommittee could borrow from the distance learning rules at the education department. Second, we urge the subcommittee to ensure veterans have the same rights as other students in the quality of VA education programs. Veterans count on the GI Bill to help them with smooth transition to a successful civilian career. They actively rely on the VA's program approval as a stamp of approval on the quality of a school. Unfortunately, the statutes governing program approval are outdated, referencing classes taught over the radio, for example, and are quite lax, allowing many veterans to be negatively impacted by substandard and even fraudulent programs before the programs are problems are discovered. For example, why were standards for GI Bill approval so low that programs such as Fast Train College and Ready Retail Center were eligible? Recently, veterans reached out to us about a facade Bible college and a dog training program. Both schools take veterans GI Bill benefits, including their housing, fail to provide any substantive education and treat the veterans as if they are indentured servants. And one even threatened the veteran for filing a complaint to the VA. The problem is likely to be exacerbated during COVID as low quality and predatory colleges are increasing enrollment and are dramatically ramping up their advertising and recruiting. They are the only sector that is increasing enrollment right now. To ensure veterans get at least some benefit from their GI Bill at approved schools, we recommend the subcommittee enhance program approval criteria by requiring minimum quality metrics that are readily available through the education department's public data. This includes student earnings, student debt, cohort default rates, graduation rates, licensure pass rates, faculty credentials, financial stability, ensuring schools are not under law enforcement or regulatory cloud at the time they apply for VA approval, 
and requiring schools to spend at least one third of the tuition they charge VA on the veteran instruction. There would be no burden on state approving agencies to require schools to report and attest to these metrics, which many schools already report to the education department. This last metric may be less familiar to the subcommittee, so I would like to discuss this a bit more. Just as the subcommittee recently required public universities to charge VA no more than in-state tuition to educated veterans, so too the subcommittee should ensure private colleges do not overcharge VA for high tuition they are not spending on the veteran's education. Most colleges spend more on instruction than they charge the veteran. For example, the State University of New York Polytechnic Institute spent 220.9% of, uh, of tuition revenue on instruction. On the flip side, there are 107 schools approved for the GI Bill that charge VA a high tuition but spent less than 20% of the tuition on instruction. Only one in five of these schools had better than a 50% graduation rate or better than 50% of their graduates earning more than a high school graduate. And there are four schools that failed to spend even 10% of tuition on the veterans education, but instead spent nearly 40% of tuition on marketing and recruiting. The same marketing and recruiting deemed fraudulent by every state and the FTC. We urge you to protect veterans, the VA, and taxpayers by requiring schools to spend at least one third of the tuition they charge VA on veterans education. Our second second set of recommendations relate to direct help for veterans, including require an orderly school, uh, school closure process, automate GI Bill restoration based on VA enrollment records without requiring paperwork from the veteran, restore GI Bill benefits if a student claims he or she was defrauded by the school and there's government evidence of such fraud, prohibit retroactive adjustments of GI Bill eligibility if there was no fraud by the veteran, ensure VA's debt collection remains paused during COVID and revise the statute to prohibit aggressive debt collection. Additionally, we would like to see continued movement towards improving the GI Bill, a comparison tool in vr &E. We also support the request of our colleagues and ask the subcommittee to ensure VA has adequate IT funding. Finally, You're muted, Ms. Singh. Sorry. <laughs> finally, the American Legion, uh, finally, like the American Legion, closing the 9010 loophole remains a top priority. I appreciate the committee's continued commitment to supporting student veterans and their families and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Singh. And uh, I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes to begin the, the questions. And uh, I envision this as sort of an open forum, so my questions today are open to any of you uh, that wishes to comment, and I encourage you to, to do so. Uh, with the increased unemployment rates that we're seeing uh, that a number of us spoke to, we, we certainly have to continue our focus on education and employment-related programs in the new Congress. Uh, this committee, as you know, uh, has made or proposed many temporary changes in veterans' education and employment programs to mitigate COVID-related hardships, uh, including S-3503 back in March, the Student Veteran Coronavirus Response Act uh, in April, and the Pandemic Assistance for Student Veterans Act more recently in October. So my question for uh, the group uh, is, in looking at these temporary changes, uh, are there any that you believe should be permanent? And if so, which ones? Sir, I'd be happy to, to kick us off. As I said in my verbal testimony, we believe that there is a conversation to be had about making some of those previously temporary changes permanent, especially to be immediately activated when a national emergency is declared. It was really a Herculean effort that you and your team and the Senate had to go through to get those two emergency bills passed in a time that made it possible for student veterans to have some assurances of their housing payments remaining steady. And the last thing we want to do is put student veterans or really anybody in that stressful position again. There's definitely a conversation worth having about making some of that permanent. Thank you. I, I would agree. I, I think that if we can, the amount of time and effort it took just to address a national crisis, if we could codify some of that, that would make it significantly better should we ever face something like this in the future. Anybody else? Well, I'll uh, I'll move on. Uh, looking at uh, long-term reform, we've heard from a number of employers that it can be difficult and confusing to navigate the many different federal, state, and local programs that are geared towards veteran employment. I've I've heard that uh, in our district. 
Uh, our employers want to hire veterans. They want to start apprenticeships or on-the-job training geared towards veterans, but sometimes they're not sure how to do it or they don't get enough applicants. I've even heard this from the local employers in my district where I think we have one of the highest populations of veterans in the entire United States. Even some of them uh, express uh, concern or some confusion on this. And we've been trying in our office, as I'm sure my colleagues have, to help connect the dots uh, with the local military veteran and business communities. But I think we've witnessed the need for a more streamlined approach in order to leverage these opportunities and uh, to strengthen veteran employment at the end of the day. So my question for any of you is how can we better align programs so that employers have a single point of entry? Mr. Congressman, uh, <clears throat> thank you for that opportunity. Uh, the one of the suggestions the VFW has is, is forming that connection in the in the TAP classes, uh, having having a feeder program, having a centralized resource that can point to regional and local uh, employment opportunities. We're not going to be able to get in every single TAP class, every single local opportunities. But if there are centralized uh, resources under one umbrella, that's something that in the TAP class, we can begin that process. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Anybody else? Please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also agree that we make it less difficult for companies to engage service members before they separate, especially our guard and reservists. We'll find that we'll see often better outcomes while employers are able to talk about what the opportunities look like, but also how service members and their spouses can engage those opportunities and making sure on the state level that uh, service members in particular currently serving are a higher priority than they are currently when it comes to employment. Thank you for that. And, and I'll just uh, close by uh, making a request, which is uh, that I'm gonna need your help uh, in the next uh, months to try to work together to press the Senate uh, to get uh, much of the legislation uh, that we have worked diligently on in the House uh, across the finish line. Uh, there are a number of critical bills and uh, I'm very grateful for the work we've done uh, on a bipartisan basis. So if anyone has any creative suggestions or ideas, how we compel the Senate to get these bills across the finish line in the 10 seconds remaining, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna keep working at it and we're gonna need your help and it's uh, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn uh, to my friend, the ranking member, uh, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has made many Americans realize that they can work and learn online successfully. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me, Mr. Chairman. Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. What is your view of uh, HR? This is for the entire panel. So, uh, what is your view? of H.R. 3897 uh, that would end the disparity of paying students taking all their GI Bill approved coursework online, significantly less than students attending traditional brick and mortar schools. Uh, you know, I think it's 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 unfair. Uh, there could be a brick and mortar school hundreds of miles away, uh, and it's more convenient for the veteran, obviously, uh, but then they the veteran chooses to to, to do uh, their work online. Even there are benefits, of course, to the uh, the brick and mortar, but there are benefits uh, to having the, the veteran online in his or her home, uh, particularly during the pandemic. So, and I know we address this uh, short term, uh, but I, I I think we need a long term solution. Anyone have a, an opinion on that? Uh, yes, sir. I think that you're, you're absolutely correct in the irony in that we are seeing we are already doing this in the short term with with the uh, but looking back when you think about working mothers, uh, folks starting a family or folks that are in an environment where there's not a local school uh, that what what is it that says that they are as entitled to their basic allowance of housing as someone who attends school in person? So it's absolutely an issue that we think about in getting uh, veterans at that level of housing allowance. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Ranking Mr. Member, Mr. Rockus, the uh, 
the, the issue of online only students receiving one half the national average is something the VFW is concerned about and would like to see more parity uh, around. The majority of student veterans are non-traditional uh, students. There are a, a lot of service members that take these classes while they're stationed at bases. Some overseas utilizing their GI Bill. Uh, the, the online only learning platform has evolved greatly in years. Similar to what we're doing right now, the evolution right. of two-way audiovisual communication with the teacher and the students has changed greatly uh, to improve the learning experience. I agree. Anyone else? Mr. Ranking Member, uh, so I grew up in Oklahoma, a uh, small town military base. The problem we have with, with them getting the full BAH is the town I grew up in, we have a fantastic state school. Really good school, over a thousand veterans attend there. The BAH at that state school is $900 a month because of the cost of living in rural Oklahoma. And so you would be incentivizing students to leave some of these great state schools to go to school online because the BAH would be significantly higher. The national average BAH rate is about 1700. So they would receive $800 more a month to go online and could defer, could uh, cause some issues with students wanting to go to some of those schools. I, I also would like to jump in. I think one of our biggest concerns is the fact that it could potentially um, increase more predatory behavior on, um, on student veterans. Additionally, when you see programs such as like current um, issues related to online learning with students watching YouTube videos instead of actually having the face-to-face -face interaction with their professors um, via online formats, uh, provides a lot of concern related to the quality of education that they would receive in those um, uh, at that time. So I, I think we have some we have some strong concerns around it. I will. I, I will work with you uh, and uh, make sure we have those safeguards in place. Um, and I really appreciate the input. OK, I, I, know, I don't know how much time I have, but maybe one more question. Uh, this is for the entire panel again. What is one thing that Congress and a new administration can do in the first 100 days of the next Congress to help veterans face economic hardship of a result uh, as a result of COVID-19. Who would like to go first? Mr. Bilrakis, a very easy solution is fund the vet tech program at a, at a higher level, request higher uh, funds. The program is running out of money because so many people are taking it. That's kind of a good problem. It's yeah. showing how popular it is. More resources for vet tech, I think, could uh, help mitigate that problem. Anyone yes. else? Good yes, time. sir. I, I would echo what Pat said. And then also add, uh, there's a wonderful bill, the rapid retraining program that could definitely help address some immediate needs, quick needs, particularly for people who aren't eligible for the GI Bill. I know that has a lot of support behind it. That's something that can easily happen in the first 100 days of the next Congress. Very good. Thank and you. if I may really quick, I just want to add, I think most of us have testified about the need to get IT funding into the VBA side of the house. So, you know, the quicker we get that going, the better off our veterans are for success across the board next year. Very good. Thank you. I Thank would you. also ask, uh, go ahead. look at how we can better um, get HUD more involved so that we can better stabilize those veterans who are teetering on homelessness as well as streamlining any effects that we can with accessing those benefits and um, therefore further utilization of both uh, disability benefits as well as any additional resources. All right, well, very good suggestions. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope the, the Senate is listening to this hearing. <laughs> I appreciate it and I'll yield back. I thank the ranking member and I hope so too. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, recognize the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, Chairman Takano, for his questions. I think that's me. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Levin. And uh, I see uh, after your first two years in Congress, uh, you have discovered that often the uh, so-called enemy is not our rival uh, partisan colleagues, but it's the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I look. That's a long discussion about how we deal with that. But you know, I want to. I want to use my time uh, to get into uh, the issues here. Um, uh, Mr. Malagrun, um, 
I'm struck by these numbers of uh, of minorities who are not able to take uh, advantage of the home loan program. Um, do you have any, is there any study that shows uh, the history of intergenerational wealth uh, based on the GI Bill, uh, you know, how it's helped uh, African Americans and minorities over the time of its existence, um, and also uh, what might uh, have caused uh, intergenerational wealth not to have been uh, as robust uh, as, uh, as, as it is for our white veterans? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the glaring issues, I think what I could use as an example is my own family. Uh, my grandfather served in World War II, my great uncle served in World War II, but when they came home, they were often denied opportunity, both access and utilization of home ownership benefits. So, as we see a generational impact, they were not able to pass on that wealth through home ownership and also through their GI Bill benefits to their descendants. So, often we see in many communities, that veterans who are coming from underserved communities have not been encouraged and have often been discouraged from using these benefits. I would love to see a more longitudinal uh, study where we can gather more data on what that impact has looked like, both economically, socially, as well as uh, emotionally for these communities, because uh, many of your constituents, for example, in Riverside have looked at how their family members have benefited or not benefited for military service, and quite frankly, this can often have an impact on man manpower and retention as we look to recruit a future force. Chairman Levin, I, I think we, you and I ought to have the GAO and the Congressional Research Service, we ought to scan what's been done on this topic. I mean, I, I'm imagining uh, some devastating numbers because we know these home loan programs probably originated right after World War II. Um, we know there was a time period where African Americans couldn't even buy in certain neighborhoods, um, and um, home ownership is part of intergenerational wealth being built. And of course, our military has been one of the places where we've made such progress uh, in race relations uh, with the integration of the armed services under Harry Truman. We're going to mark that day very soon. Um, I think it's important that uh, we understand the history of these programs and to the extent to which. They've had different outcomes. Uh, uh, I mean, the economic opportunity is the name of the subcommittee you lead, and I think this is a very important topic. Um, thank you for being here, sir. And um, uh, this is just one of the areas I think we need to look at. Um, I'd like to turn to um, the uh, issue of the nine, the ninety ten rule. Uh, I'm I'm convinced that this also uh, this ninety ten rule because of its because of its loophole also hurts. Uh, uh, minorities, uh, as well as, uh, you know, all veterans. Um, you know, I, I was struck by this recommendation uh, uh, about requiring at least 30% of uh, VA GI Bill funds be spent on instruction. Um, why not higher? Why not 50% plus one? Uh, you know, uh, can you can you respond to that? Yes, happy to. I I don't think we have, I think 30% would be the minimum quality threshold that we would throw out there. We have um, seen some schools that have spent the 30% and, and it's, you know, they still have um, solid outcomes. We would always appreciate the 50 plus um, percent plus plus um, in there. We just believe that there needs to be some sort of uh, return on investment uh, for taxpayers. As a taxpayer, if I'm spending my money towards something, I wanna know that it's actually going towards what I'm paying for it. As a veteran, I would want them to actually know that their hard-earned benefits are going towards what they believe that they're supposed to be going to rather than to frivolous things that, that aren't provi providing that. Well, how do you arrive at this number of 250% uh, in New York? Is it just because uh, that university that you were referring to um, uh, uh, subsidizes uh, the the, uh, the tuition with um, taxpayer money and uh, philanthropy money, that sort of thing. Is that, is that how you arrive at that? 
we what we actually have a report related to this that I'm happy to share with you um, with your office when we're done. Um, but but what we have done through that research is found that uh, they have been uh, able to. We went through the US Ed's iPads data and uh, were able to find that data specifically through them. So I'm happy to share that report with the committee after um, you know um, after the hearing. Yeah, I understand how you arrive at these at these conclusions and methodologies. I mean, I can, I can understand. I mean, I, I can believe uh, that some institutions actually, uh, you know, provide so much more value that the that the tuition that's being paid, um, uh, the percentage is actually, you know, a, it's actually a portion of the educational the instructional cost uh, that they're benefiting from. And it's incredible to think that we have for profit institutions. Uh, that greatly um, outweigh, um, well, that the, the, the spent almost very uh, virtually a very small fraction on instruction. Anyway, I see my I see a flashing light, and my time is up, and I'll yield back. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working with you on the the uh, issues we just discussed, and we'll make sure we have uh, our team reach out. Uh, with that, I'd like to recognize uh, General Bergman uh, for five minutes. Well, good morning, everybody. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zoom takes on so many different characters or WebEx or whatever, you know, uh, mode we're using. But, uh, you know, one of the challenges is is to bring all things into the light of day, uh, including in our offices when the sun shines through and it makes you look like some kind of a cart cartoon caricature. So, so the bottom line is, um, Chairman Takano, you look spectacular. I just wanted to let you know that. So anyway, the lighting is good for you. Now, the, the, po the point is when we shine light on things, we need to shine, this, uh, this is a serious comment now, the frivolity's over, gang. Okay, the, when we shine light on things, we wanna make sure that we shine that light in such a way that all of us, whether it's, uh, committee members here, members of the House of Representatives, you as the VSOs and other entities who work with Congress and the VA to get good legislation and policy, and also the VA, the people who work in there every day that are trying to do the right thing for our veterans for all the right reasons. And finally, to the companies who are trying to provide whatever it is they're providing to veterans that we would either okay or not okay or develop policy for. That's a long way of saying that if you break down, and this is gonna, this is kind of, kind of a, I'm, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not gonna ask anybody to answer this, but it's for contemplation as we go forward. If you take 100% of the men and women who choose to serve in the United States military, Roughly 69% of those who serve in uniform serve one eight year commitment. So they enlist, they, they, you know, they enlist for eight years, their contract could be four by four, two by six, six by two, whatever it happens to be. But you're talking right there, almost 70% of the men and women who serve are going to leave active service somewhere between the ages of 22 and 32 years of age. When you think about where they are in their, in their maturity of life, life's experiences, married, kids, all of those things, you're looking at right now 70% of the population who falls into that category. Why that's important is that as we seek to inform veterans, about the opportunities available to them. We have a, a really unique uh, segment of that population who are still in the individual ready reserve, who have left active duty. So when we talk about outreach, whether it's job fairs, uh, uh, different things, uh, events hosted by the individual services or the guard, I believe we have some untapped opportunities here to make the veterans outreach. Because we, I would suggest, if we get any solution that is policy, not law, law is 100%. It's either 
legal or not, but policy at best is going to be an 80% solution across the board. That is the, the statistical analysis of how you do good policy. Where we need to be advised by all of you is when we're shooting for that 80% solution, we know where we need to have on ramps and off ramps or minor exceptions for that 20% that fall out of the statistical norm. So that's where your input to our deliberations in conjunction with that of the VA will help us knowing we can't get it 100% right. We get it 80% right and then again, make the exception. So I'm just looking forward to our 117th Congress as we move forward with that 80% solution in mind and then continue to adjust good results for the long term to become great results knowing not that not every program is going to be effective as we envisioned it but it should meet the needs of the veterans and if it's if it's if it's not working we need to stop doing it so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back and uh, just thank you for everybody's intellectual engagement, physical engagement, and thinking about different ways we can we can do this. And uh, a very Merry Christmas to all of you. For five minutes. Anthony, can you hear us? There you go. I can. You were cut off there for a minute, Mike. Chairman. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to all of our panelists who are here today. And uh, as we look forward towards uh, to, towards next year, I think we all can agree that uh, on our agenda, uh, fighting this pandemic is uh, issue number one, both in terms of health care and the economic recovery. And what we're finding is that too many veterans are out of work right now. Uh, they're out of a job, uh, they're out of luck, and this includes many veterans that I've talked to in my district who can't get food uh, they need to feed their families during this difficult economic time. I have a great organization in my district. It's called Feed Our Vets. Uh, they work to battle hunger among veterans. Uh, they were founded back in 2008 by a, a local Navy veteran, uh, Rich Sinek, and since then they've helped to feed something like 20,000 hungry veterans and their families um, in, in my area. So after all we've done, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but after all uh, they have done for, for our country, uh, we really should not see any veteran uh, ever go to bed hungry or their families. So uh, Mr. Lagrune, uh, you had mentioned in your testimony, the compounding effect food scarcity can have on veterans facing economic difficulties. What can be done in Congress and in communities to make sure veterans and their families have enough to eat? Yes, sir. Thank you again for asking. Um, one of the examples I'll use is what's worked in, for example, Chicago. There is a partnership with one of the local nonprofits, as well as one of the philanthropic organizations that chose to build a pantry, a food pantry, in conjunction with the VA. And what that's allowed them to do is both access the community of veterans coming to the VA, but also bring other veterans who hadn't engaged the VA system into the same space through this collaboration that now we can connect them to resources and services, as well as their immediate needs around food. And I think that if we start thinking about what's the best bang for the buck, right? Once we have a stagnant and stationary target, we try to strike as best possible, right? I'm using a little artillery term, but for me, I think Opportunities like that is where we really get a, a huge impact and in inroad if we can build better collaborations, not solely put this responsibility on the VA to address the needs of veterans. Our private public partners and municipalities are doing some of this work, but it's not as cohesive as we'd like to see it be. So I think through the subcommittee and through the Congress, we really can drive better collaboration and incentivize it through uh, a means of supporting these efforts to feed our our veterans and military families throughout the country. Thank you, Mr. Lagrune. And, and Mr. Murray, your, your testimony mentioned underemployment by veterans and their spouses uh, and the need to boost employment opportunities. Can you expand a little bit on that? What would you like to see Congress do to help uh, the veterans most in need uh, as our economy recovers here during this pandemic? 
Thank you, Mr. Brindisi. It, as, as I described, that's not a, a one step solution. We truly wish it was right. We wish there was the, the easy button to hit. Uh, but we think that Congress can use its authority, can use its power and influence to convene uh, the major stakeholders, uh, whether that's DOD, DOL, local and state entities, uh, to, to bring together folks so that we can find out exactly what the roadblocks are. And maybe can be addressed on the federal level. Uh, our, our suggestion, I wish, as I said, I wish we had one, but I think what, what Congress can do is truly be a convener for this problem. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to shift gears just real quick to uh, Made in America. This is a topic that uh, is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, Mr. Kamen, uh, I want to thank you for mentioning in your testimony the need for the government, including the VA, uh, to buy American. This is something that we have many conversations about in this committee and, and in other committees. Uh, when every country in the world is looking for PPE at the same time, we just can't rely on buying masks and other equipment overseas. We need uh, the capacity to make enough PPE domestically. So uh, I'm just curious, wh why has the American Legion uh, elevated this issue as, uh, as one of your priorities? Yes, sir. I think it really, uh, this has been a formative year for us, for our organization, as well as uh, most of our fellow countrymen and women. And uh, we took a survey of our members uh, over their attitudes about uh, coronavirus very on, uh, I believe it was April. Uh, and within three days, we had over 23,000 responses to what people's concerns were. And we realized then that this is an issue that uh, is going to stay in our members' hearts for a long time. And that we're not, not going to be forgotten. And that the best way to prepare for it is, is that we internalize these lessons and protect our, our supply chains. And it just so happens that there's a cross section between that and a lot of veteran owned businesses, which are American, which are struggling to compete in a globalized market. And when it comes to that, our national security posture and our health, uh, it became a common sense uh, resolution that we arrived upon. I, I see my time is up. I appreciate your, your advocacy on that issue, something I'm going to push a lot more uh, moving forward here. And uh, thank you all for your service to our, our nation's veterans. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Brindisi, appreciate it. I'd now like to recognize uh, my friend, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you very much to our witnesses. I appreciate your informative statements and, and uh, answers to our questions. Uh, Mr. Murray and Ms. Elias, thank you very much for expressing your support for improving the VA's automobile allowance program. Uh, we certainly appreciate VFWs and PBAs and, and all uh, organizations representing our veterans for their support for the Auto for Veterans Act. Um, the Auto for Veterans Act, uh, just as an update, was introduced by myself and Representative Brandisi. Uh, we are very pleased that Senator Collins as well is leading the bill in the Senate with bipartisan support. The Auto for Veterans Act expands the existing automobile grant program to allow veterans to receive an additional grant uh, for 10 years after their initial 10 years. Um, as you both pointed out, uh, the one-time grant has a, uh, such automobiles have an average life of 11 years. Uh, so uh, our uh, veterans who have sustained service-related injuries um, don't have uh, much of an option after the first uh, after the, the the first grant. So this this bill imp greatly improves upon that and is uh, quite necessary. An estimated 2,425 veterans use this benefit in uh, fiscal year 2020. And um, those who who are eligible, by the way, are only those who. Uh, for, for, for my colleagues who sustain service-related injuries, uh, loss or permanent loss of uh, both feet, uh, loss or permanent loss of use of, of, of one or both hands, uh, uh, permanent vision impairment, in both eyes to a certain degree, severe burns, and uh, a diagnosis of ALS. So we're really talking about uh, those who fought for our country that are quite disabled. Now, I'd like to just ask quick, uh, Ms. Elias, the, 
Let's discuss the importance of transportation to our VA facilities, as well as to work for, uh, for social, uh, for just maintaining a social lifestyle, as well as um, healthcare. We've got some serious issues with, with vets, of course, when it comes to suicide and, and just overall access to everything the VA has to offer. So in general, uh, Ms. Elias, what would you say, discuss for, for a minute what the importance of having access and transportation and our veterans being able to mobilize themselves? Thank you so much for that question. I'd love to talk about this. Uh, it's something I get pretty passionate about, especially as a mental health advocate. You know, independence is something that we never want to take for granted. And having access to an automobile that is adapted so that a veteran can drive themselves to and from their health care appointments, which we know are essential for this population, so that they can go to work and not only receive the mental health benefits of being with, you know, their peers and working towards something that's gainful and meaningful, but also actively participating and contributing to their economy. It gives you a good feeling. And then also, you know, one of the benefits of, of having access to that vehicle is, is, you know, COVID aside, you have that opportunity to go visit your family. You have the opportunity to be independent. And especially among women veterans who are less likely to be married, uh, they have to rely on public transportation if they don't have access to a vehicle like this. Uh, and also, you know, when this grant was initially started, uh, our veterans, you know, with these injuries didn't live that long. Now, thanks to great medical advancements, more veterans are, are still living after, you know, what might have killed them in past wars, but they're living to where their body can no longer access the vehicle that they originally got through that grant. So a younger veteran might be able to pull themselves in and out of a sedan. But as they age, they're in a wheelchair full time and no longer have the physical capabilities to lift themselves in and out of that vehicle and need to shift to like a minivan or an adaptive van. And those vehicles are quite costly. So having access to a vehicle, another or an additional vehicle grant will not only really improve mental health, but, you know, just give them more options for their life as they age. Thank you. And I agree. It's an incredibly important bill. Now, do you have any examples, and we have very little time left, of those who could not get a second vehicle? And the, what, what, what did they do? Be, sure. so, because of the okay. current law that exists, current fund that exists. Yeah, so that's a great question. One of the things that we're hearing from veterans that aren't able to access the second grant is that they're driving vehicles that are well over their, their, you know, expected life date. And so these vehicles are almost a little bit dangerous for the veteran as well as other individuals on the road. But because of the cost of the car and the cost of getting those adaptations, they continue to drive it so they don't lose that independence or that Thank access you. to transportation. Great. We, it's so important that we that we give to those who've sacrificed so much to us this, uh, this important bill. So I yield back. Back, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Muser. And uh, with that, I uh, believe all members uh, that attended have asked questions, and I'm grateful for for great attendance today from our uh, subcommittee members. Uh, and we can begin to bring this hearing to a close. I'd like to uh, recognize uh, our uh, full committee chairman, Chairman Takano, uh, who has a closing statement. Thank you, Chairman Levin. Uh, Thank uh, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Ranking Member Belarakis, uh, for this hearing again. Uh, we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us. Uh, we have the challenge of making sure that um, our veterans uh, get through this pandemic um, as as well as they can, and to make sure those veterans who are under stress and distress. Uh, that we have the retraining programs, uh, the high quality, uh, high quality uh, educational and training programs um, uh, with proper oversight uh, that uh, will not uh, use their benefits and short them uh, of the training and education that they need to get through this uh, this pandemic moment. Um, we have, uh, I think, the obligation. Uh, to look at the ways in which um, there have been disparate impacts uh, economically uh, that this pandemic has revealed that pre-existed this pandemic. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to take a look at those disparate impacts on our veterans of color uh, and our, our women veterans. Um, 
not to vilify any uh, particular group as having done it, but we need to, I think, examine uh, societally and systemically um, how these different outcomes come to pass. Um, these are some of the things that have been, I think, uh, forced to the surface uh, by the challenge uh, that we now confront. Um, I wish everyone well during this holiday season, um, and I look forward to uh, even greater work being done in a bipartisan spirit in the 117th Congress. Let's look back at great pride with what we have achieved together in the 116th. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate you and uh, really uh, are grateful for your joining us uh, here as well. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn for a uh, closing statement to my friend, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Bill Arrakis. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Again, it's been great working with the entire committee and the staff uh, this term, and uh, I believe we've uh, worked together and accomplished a lot uh, in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and this particular hearing was outstanding, and uh, the, really the uh, the testimony of the VSOs uh, really helped us out a lot, give us a lot of input, uh, and uh, and uh, you see where their priorities are for the next uh, term. But uh, I appreciate all of you. Thanks for treating us well. I believe the the entire minority uh, was treated extremely well, and. Uh, you know, look forward to working with you next year. And I, I wish that the, the whole Congress operated the way this subcommittee and the full committee, by the way, does. Uh, and again, I know that uh, that the Dr. Rose is not on, but uh, he's done an outstanding job. What a great patriot. And we're going to miss him greatly. Thank you. And I yield back. Well, I thank the ranking member, and I certainly share uh, that sentiment for Dr. Rowe and his great service, and, and also your sentiment, sentiment that uh, I just want to thank our colleagues uh, and, and also the, the respective staff just for continuing the work of the subcommittee uh, in a, a spirit of collegiality, a spirit of collaboration. Uh, and my particular thanks to you, our, our ranking member, and I wish your Florida Gators uh, much success against LSU and I think Alabama after that. Don't tell uh, Garrett Graves I said that, but I wish you much success against LSU and then good luck against the Crimson Tide. But uh, I, I wanted to take just a, a moment also uh, and honor those that uh, lost their lives uh, 79 years ago yesterday uh, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, as we know, a date uh, which will live in infamy, and all those who served with honor in World War II, uh, including my grandfather, uh, who's since passed away. But I hope we take that opportunity uh, just to rededicate ourselves to our veterans uh, and to their families. Uh, it's been a, also a terrific honor to get to work with our VSOs. Uh, we meet quite regularly. I look forward to that, uh, hopefully in person again really soon. Uh, that will be great. I miss those discussions, uh, but look forward to uh, to moving forward uh, aggressively and and uh, uh, collaboratively with all of you in the new year uh, to advance these policies. Uh, but uh, I thank you all again uh, for a great uh, for me a great first couple of years in Congress. I'm looking forward to the next uh, two years and uh, hopefully a long time to come. Uh, with that, uh, all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include additional materials. And without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thanks, everybody.